Very often in history, there are great partnerships in which two people work together, each contributing a different skill to bring an idea or movement to its fruition. One may have the genius and inspiration, the other business and organizational skills. One may be skilled at theory, the other at practice and implementation. Or one may be an articulate writer, the other an eloquent speaker. But what's most extraordinary about these partnerships is that, more often than not, the partners never even met. In fact, many of them lived at different times, sometimes decades, sometimes centuries apart. Or they lived in different countries. Their partnership was a partnership of minds, unaffected by either time or place. Such was the case of Martin Luther and John Calvin. The lives of Luther and Calvin overlapped somewhat. Luther was born 26 years earlier and died almost 20 years earlier. They knew of each other's existence, but Luther was in Germany, Calvin was in Switzerland, and each was busy with his own tasks, which, though not joined, were united in the same goal, the reformation of Christianity. It was Luther, with no intention of doing so, who triggered the Protestant movement. It was Calvin who then took that movement and defined it, gave it order and structure, and wrote the first complete and clear statement of its principles. Where Luther had been the heart of Protestantism, now Calvin became its intellect. Where Luther was the founder, Calvin, so to speak, became the president. Because of their common destiny, there was much the two men shared in both viewpoint and experience. But because of their special roles in that destiny, there was also much that differed between them, both in personality and outlook. Calvin was born on July 10, 1509, in the town of Noyon, north of Paris, France. His father was a churchman, not out of piety, but out of ambition. He was more drawn to the social and financial privileges of religion than the thought of salvation. Mr. Calvin's influence was enough to win his son a chaplaincy at the cathedral at age 11 and a curacy at 18, positions that relied as much on connections as on training or merit. When John was 19, his father's ambition finally got the best of him, and he was excommunicated for misuse of church funds, dying only three years later. Before he died, the elder Calvin had already set his mind that son John would follow in his footsteps and seek his worldly success through the church. He sent him to the University of Paris when he was 14 to study medieval scholarship. Calvin spent four years there, immersed in conservative theology, and became so proficient at logic and debate, and so argumentative, that he was nicknamed the Accusative Case. When his theological studies were over, Calvin's father suddenly had a change of heart, helped by the fact that he'd been excommunicated, and decided law, more than religion, was the road to wealth and honors. He sent Calvin to Orléans to get legal training, and Calvin again dutifully obeyed. He put into the law the same zeal he'd put into theology, working until midnight and arising early to ponder over what he'd learned the night before. His dedication was matched by a spectacular memory, which enabled him to excel in law as he had in theology. Like religion, he studied law for four years, at the end of which he was both an expert theologian and an eloquent jurist. Unlike most leaders in the Reformation, however, he was never ordained a priest. When his father died, Calvin was able to abandon his law studies and do what he really wanted to do. He settled in Paris and immersed himself in the classics, including Greek and Latin. When he was 32... Calvin wrote his first of many works, this one called Commentary on Seneca's Treatise on Clemency, a study written in perfect Latin and filled with classical quotations and high ethical principles. By the time he was 24, Calvin had completed his formal education, but now he was faced with two other problems. One was his health, which had deteriorated during the long years of intensive study, and the other was his faith which seemed to have atrophied while his intellect blossomed. He said he could find no peace of conscience, and that he had fallen into obliviousness. <laughs>
a word he used to describe the deliberate closing of his mind to spiritual woes. This oblivion was very short-lived. Sometime in the following year, he felt the call of God. John Calvin's conversion was sudden and quick, yet he never described how it occurred. He said only, God at last turned my course in another direction by the secret reign of his providence. Whether it was an internal experience, whether he attained it through reason, or whether it involved a human instrument is unknown. What is known is that all at once he felt his will had been forged with divine will, and he found himself with a mission. Calvin had been exposed to Protestant ideas for many years, and some of his friends and colleagues were Protestants. But at first he had been offended by the teachings of Martin Luther, listened to them with what he called an unwilling ear, and refused to accept the suggestion that the church into which he was born had been in the wrong for fifteen hundred years. That all changed, mysteriously, when he was in his mid-twenties. Now this bookish and reticent scholar was suddenly a soldier, proclaiming that when God calls us to himself, he dedicates us so that our whole life may set forth his honor. Calvin, like Luther, became convinced that God speaks to people only through the Scriptures. Unlike Luther, this conviction filled him with fury, because God's words had been, as he put it, hidden, perverted, corrupted, and depraved. He resigned the chaplaincy and curacy his father had procured for him, and prepared for battle. We live in a time of war, he said and there is no better lot for us than to gather around a standard where we gain courage to go on fighting until death. Almost as soon as he resigned, he was charged with heresy and thrown into prison in Noyon. He escaped the usual fate, being burned at the stake, but it was too dangerous in France, just the same. Instead, he headed for Basel, in Switzerland, where there was already a community of Protestants, many of them refugees like he, from throughout Europe. In Basel, Calvin wrote his 519-page masterpiece entitled The Institutes of the Christian Religion, the first well-ordered statement of the principles of Christianity from a Protestant standpoint. Originally, he intended it as a brief summary of Christian belief to defend French Protestants who were enduring severe persecution. But the work grew and grew until he'd written a complete Protestant creed, put it into a system, and given it discipline and clarity. When he was done, he hoped the work would protect the new faith both from Rome and from fringe elements in Protestantism itself. The Institutes offered a logical, rational, and convincing argument for the Protestant Reformation, in language both theologians and the people could understand. Within nine months, it was sold out. The main points of the Institutes were these. God was all-powerful and bound neither by compassion nor laws. He governs all things in ways that can't be understood by humans. The falling of a leaf or the falling of a nation all happens at his command. The Bible was the sole source of God's law, and it was man's duty to study and interpret it. No religious official, the Pope included, had authority over the Scriptures. Humankind is trapped in its own sinfulness. God chooses who will be saved. These few are called the elect. Men are so sinful and disobedient that none of them are truly worthy of heaven. But God allows a few in anyway, regardless of their merit, to demonstrate the freedom of His authority. Only these elect or chosen ones, will be saved. This, of course, raised the question of how one could know if he or she was an elect, and what they could do to improve their chances. It was something Martin Luther agonized over, but not John Calvin. He came up with what he believed were three simple requirements. The profession of faith, a rigorously disciplined Christian life, and a love of the sacraments. If people could meet these tests... They could assume they would be among the elect and cease to worry about it. Calvin also wrote the universal priesthood. All believers were considered priests, 
all were equal in the faith. Believers should see themselves as instruments of God. Calvin said, God uses the services of men to do his work through them, just as a craftsman uses his tools. The man who heard God's call or understood his word was therefore compelled to act. Work, labor, and daily tasks were essential in Calvin's doctrine. Christianity was intended to reform all of society. Every occupation merited dedication and zeal. Before the Reformation, the word vocation was used only for the work of priests. After the Reformation, vocation became any career or work in the world. The change occurred because of John Calvin's view that every occupation in society is a calling to serve God. For that reason, Calvinists then and now have been deeply involved in political, social, educational, and economic developments. Calvin's doctrine was Catholic in that it accepted the Trinity, human sinfulness, and the saving work of Jesus Christ. It was Protestant in its commitment to the Bible as the final authority, and in its belief that justification, or salvation, was gained by God's grace through faith alone, not through ritual, confession, penitence, pilgrimage, or any of the practices promoted by Rome. It was Protestant, too, in its insistence on the need for discipline in the Church and the ethical seriousness of life. And unlike the Catholic God, Calvin's God was not to be feared. He was mild, kind, gentle, and compassionate. He wins us by the sweetness of his goodness, he said. After the publication of the Institutes, Calvin intended to devote his life to further study and writing. But on a trip to Strasbourg, he was forced to take a detour through Geneva that became a permanent detour to his plans. The Institute had made Calvin famous among reformers all over Europe. Because of his book, Calvin was asked to stay and help the city of Geneva, which was in need of a pastor with a strong will and leadership abilities. For over a decade, Geneva had been in the throes of religious and political revolt. Dissension, riots, and rebellions were threatening to reduce the Reformation in that city to mere chaos. The dominating personality in Geneva was a red-headed preacher with a fiery temperament named Guillaume Farel, who had worked long and hard to reform the city. Early in his career, he'd gained fame by standing up in the middle of Mass, striding up to the priest, and knocking the bread and wine from his hands, announcing to the stunned congregation that God existed above in heaven and not in fraudulent rituals here on earth. Pharrell had all the passion needed to start a revolution, but none of the discipline needed to transform it into an organization. When Calvin visited the city, intending only a brief stay, Pharrell convinced him to remain and make Geneva his life work. In fact, he threatened him with a curse of God if he didn't. Calvin, who truly believed Pharrell was one of God's agents, finally agreed to stay. He later explained that what kept him in Geneva, in his words, was not so much the advice and entreaty as a dreadful adjuration, as if God had stretched forth his hand upon me from on high to arrest me. At the time, Geneva was a town of 10,000 citizens who had just thrown off the authority of the bishop and a ruling duke. Protestants were just beginning to establish themselves in the city and hadn't yet joined in with the Swiss Protestant movement. This was in spite of the fact that Protestants from other Swiss cities had helped Geneva win its fight against the bishop and duke. Now the city was near to civil war, and Pharrell found himself unable to stop it. In the year after he arrived, when he was twenty-eight, Calvin wrote a series of outlines that established what he called the perfect school of Christ in the city of Geneva. To begin with, all Catholics who refused to submit to the new regime had to leave. Those who remained were required to excommunicate themselves within six months or be banished. Calvin's political strength was aided by the arrival of 6,000 Protestant refugees from France, Italy, and Spain, and at one point from England, swelling the Protestant population to 13,000. Next, he set out to make the church, state, and community into one, a utopia 
of Protestantism. In these years, Protestants all over Europe were insisting that the people, not just kings and bishops, should share in political and religious policy making. Calvin's outline reflected these views. It established a church state government in which each operated as a separate sword of Christ and worked together in harmony. The Council of 200, which ruled the city, was joined by a company of clergymen which monitored civil morality and governed the church. It was this company, or council of clergymen and elders, that established the structure of a Presbyterian form of church. The city council kept its right to legislate and punish, but the clergy was expected to scrutinize the lives of the city's citizens, report any moral lapses, and inspire the government towards enlightened legislation. It was Calvin's dream to establish a government based solely on religious law. The life of every man and woman in Geneva was to be held up to the standards of the Scriptures, and with the standards came the rules. Attendance at church and morning prayers was strictly enforced. Anything related to Roman Catholicism was forbidden, even celebration of Christmas at cost of imprisonment. The theater was denounced and especially the degenerate Italian custom of allowing women on stage instead of using boys to play female roles. According to Calvin, women performers had no purpose in mind except to expose their bodies, clothes, and ornaments to excite the impure desires of the spectators. Women, he said, should be shamefaced and shy. Such rigid proscriptions for behavior weren't new to Christianity. Way before the Reformation, the Catholic Church had tried to eliminate gambling, dancing, and common singing, and before Calvin's arrival in Geneva, the city government had already outlawed blasphemy, oaths, and card-playing, and had limited the sale of liquor. Calvin's doctrines weren't designed to eliminate fun altogether. Calvinists danced, whined, and had social get-togethers in their own homes. The institutes themselves stated that it was not anywhere forbidden to laugh or to enjoy food or to add new possessions to old and ancestral property or to be delighted with musical harmonies or to drink wine. The issue was the purpose of these indulgences. They should arise not from man's desire for pleasure for its own sake, but from joyous Christian fellowship. As to who would decide whether it was Christian fellowship or not, the answer was the clergy. To Calvin, the minister's task didn't end when his sermon was over. It was also his task to make sure the souls of his congregation weren't lost through lack of vigilance. And vigilant they were. The company of clergy, elected by the city council, decided cases involving such things as fortune-telling, the singing of obscene songs, blasphemy, adultery, witchcraft, heresy, appropriate apparel, women's hairstyles, whether a 70-year-old woman should be allowed to marry a man of 25, and even the naming of children. Claude and Martin were banned because they indicated a secret admiration of Catholic saints, and sepulchre, Sunday, and Jesus were rejected as being in poor taste. The inns of the city were reorganized and placed under government supervision with a rigid code for guests and hosts. This included what slang phrases were not to be used. No one could eat or drink anything without a blessing first and a grace after. No dancing and only honest games were to be played. Psalms were to be sung and religious pamphlets were to be made available. And nobody could stay up after nine o'clock at night except spies. Geneva was to be a city of absolute discipline, obedience, and orthodox thought, so that it might become an example to all the world. As might be expected, there were those who protested. Some resented the moral rigidity. Some believed the state should remain supreme over the church. And some simply disliked Calvin and the French friends he imported to help in his work. The opposition managed to get Calvin evicted in 1538 for a period of two years. He spent those years of exile first in Basel, then in Strasbourg, preaching to the city's French congregation. The Strasbourg period he considered the most enjoyable time of his life. 
So happy was he that it was with much reluctance that he accepted an invitation to return to Geneva, where his friends had gained control of the city council. He had once said, If God will not open a door, we must creep in through a window, slide in through the narrowest crack, rather than lose the opportunity of doing good. This was yet another of those opportunities, and he couldn't in clear conscience reject it. In 1540, when he was 31, he returned to the city he'd tried to perfect and picked up right where he left off. Only this time, he was married. The marriage of John Calvin was a very practical one, based not on romantic longing, but on an intellectual decision about what was best for him. He said with some pride, I am not of that insane class of lovers who, once captivated by beauty, kiss even its faults. The only comeliness that attracts me is this, that she be modest, complacent, unostentatious, thrifty, patient, and likely to be careful of my health. The woman who lived up to these lofty ideals was Idolette de Beur, a serious and honorable widow of a man Calvin had converted in Strasbourg. Idolette was content to design her life around her husband's demanding schedule and fame. They were married nine years and hoped to have a family, but none of their children survived past infancy. When Idolette died, Calvin commented, She was the faithful helper of my ministry. From her I never experienced the slightest hindrance. His cool detachment was only a mask. Calvin suffered deep grief when she died and mourned for months. It seems there were always two Calvins, the austere and intolerant enforcer of morality, who seemed to give way to every detail of life, who was so obsessed with purity that he couldn't even bear it if there was one speck of lint on his black robe, and the warm and affectionate Calvin that his friends spoke of. On the outside he was reticent and intellectual, never speaking in the first person, always remaining detached, and perceived by many to be cold and impersonal. Yet those who knew him well say he was affectionate and warm, had a hot temper, and was capable of close, enduring friendships. The coldness has been considered a facade that concealed his suffering and reflected his determination for control over himself and his environment. He was a man who mourned over the human condition and grieved over his own doubts. Calvin's two favorite metaphors for life were an abyss in which humans have lost their way and a labyrinth from which they can't escape. Upon his return to Geneva, Calvin discovered that the forces of opposition were still active in that city and that his days as God's soldier were far from over. The enemy this time was a man named Pierre Amio, who had a lot to lose in this new morality-sweeping Geneva, for he was a manufacturer of playing cards. At a supper party given at his house, Amio made the mistake of calling Calvin a preacher of false doctrines, and predicted that the government would soon be in the hands of French fanatics who were flocking to the city by the hundreds. A guest reported his comments to the clergy, and he was then called up before the Council of Two Hundred. The comments of Amio weren't taken by Calvin as a mere personal attack. That he could possibly have accepted. But Calvin saw himself as the servant of God, and to him the assault was therefore on the honor of Christ himself. When the council ordered Amio to go on his knees and humbly seek Calvin's pardon, it wasn't enough. Calvin insisted the council find a more suitable verdict, one for a sinner who had insulted the name of God. So Amio, clad only in a shirt, was forced to crawl through the streets of the city on his knees, begging for the mercy of God. Shortly after Amio's humiliation, another heretic rose up, this one an admirer of Calvin, who nevertheless differed with him on one main point. Jerome Bolsec found the idea of predestination absurd, for it made God into a tyrant, and, most importantly, was contradicted by the Scriptures. When he began to claim that Calvin had misinterpreted the Bible, he was exiled from Geneva forever. Amiel and Bolsec had gotten off easy. The man who would really pay for his indiscretions was a Spanish physician 
named Michael Servetus, whom Calvin had known in his university days in Paris. Servetus was a Protestant who challenged the very core of God's power and authority by denying the Trinity and the doctrine of original sin. He had fled from France, then fled from Vienna, and now had made the unwise choice to settle in Geneva, where John Calvin was more than happy to turn him over to the authorities. Calvin had debated Servetus in the Paris days, and may have even been the one who betrayed his identity to the Catholic Inquisition in Vienna. Why Servetus thought he'd be safe in Geneva, or whether he was seeking a martyr's death, is unknown. He was tried for heresy, found guilty, and sentenced to death by slow burning at the stake, a punishment his prosecutors found to be slight compared to the fires he'd encounter in hell. In the case of Servetus, Calvin had argued for a less brutal form of execution, but he gave in to the wishes of others and seemed to suffer no remorse for it. His city was to be a living tabernacle to the Lord, and there was no room for sinners or heretics. Building his tabernacle was hard work. On an average day in Geneva, Calvin would write four letters, a lecture, and a sermon, settle a local dispute, and receive as many as ten visitors, all of whom required special attention. There were also his pastoral duties, weddings, baptisms, spiritual advice, and preaching, and he attended international religious conferences where he debated Roman Catholic theologians. Calvin was a powerful speaker who, like Luther, tried to use the language of his people. He spoke in French, not Latin, and also had all his writings translated into French. Calvin's work was made all the more difficult by a weak constitution and increasing illnesses. He continually suffered from stomach troubles, chronic headaches, bouts of malaria, ulcerated hemorrhoids, gout, and gallstones. In the last years, he struggled with tuberculosis, coughing blood and gasping for breath, even as he continued to write. To Calvin, neither physical suffering nor interruptions were good enough excuses to abandon God's work. Through sheer force of will, he produced 62 books and 40,000 pages through times when many other people would have simply taken to bed and closed the shutters. In his last months, when he could no longer write, he dictated. When he could no longer walk, he insisted that he be carried to the pulpit to preach. Calvin worked until the end of his life on constructing the ideal Protestant church in Geneva. He set up a system for religious education for adults and children alike, and an academy to train people for the ministry. He also established four groups of church officers, pastors and teachers to teach and explain the scriptures, elders to administer the church, and deacons to handle the charity work. As he was building Geneva into the godliest city on earth, Calvin was also accomplishing the work that would be his greatest achievement, spreading Protestantism throughout the Western world, with his correspondence, his books, and his trained ministers. He was creating a rival to Catholicism, an efficient, tightly organized international church that trained preachers and administrators and sent them out to every corner of Europe. Calvin was corresponding with the rulers and Reformation leaders of England, Scotland, Poland, Denmark, and France. To Edward VI of England he wrote, It is a great matter to be a king, but I am sure that you count it a far greater privilege to be a Christian. Meanwhile, to the Roman Catholics, Geneva had become a hellhole of heretics and international conspirators trying to overthrow the established order and the true faith. Protestant minorities were always considered a risky element of society because they answered to their God and not to their government. They always found the strength to resist and rebel, for they felt no obligation to obey earthly power, viewed themselves the equal of kings or popes, and considered themselves first and solely as members of God's army. Calvin never supported revolution, but he did support disobedience, and said, where the glory of the Lord is not made the end of government, it is not a legitimate sovereignty, but a usurpation. Calvin died on May 27, 1564, at the age of 55, after months of intense physical suffering. He had already given instructions that no stone should mark his gravesite, as it was too insignificant.
During Calvin's last years, the city of Geneva had become home to many religious refugees, who then left with the desire to carry reform to their own countries. Under many different names, Calvinism spread throughout the Western world. In Holland, they were called Dutch Reformers. In France, they were Huguenots. In Scotland, they were simply Presbyterians. In England, they were Congregationalists or Puritans. And in South Africa, Boers. But Calvinism found its most enthusiastic audience in the colonies of New England, where pilgrims to the New World set out to establish a Puritan paradise. These Puritans brought to America many Calvinist traditions, the emphasis on work and on a highly moral and ethical lifestyle, the idea that the common people should be involved in government, and the belief that if a government failed God, it should be replaced. It is because of John Calvin that the Reformation became a part of Western civilization. It was Calvin who defined Protestantism, who organized the Presbyterian Church and wrote out a statement of its beliefs. His morality was severe, but his courage of conviction was enormous. He was completely committed to an almost impossible task, to remedy the evils of his own time. The view that all of life should glorify God is the only view that drove him, not personal gain or ambition, which could never have supplied such energy and strength. To Calvin, no detail or task was too small if done in God's name. When the honor and service of God are at stake, he said, there can be no excuse for timidity. Timid he was not. He took up the banner when still a young man and headed right out on a straight and determined path that never veered the slightest in over thirty years. His conviction was as strong as that of any man or woman who fought for any cause, religious or otherwise. Our life is like a journey, he said, but it is not God's will that we should march along casually as we please. He sets the goal before us and also directs us on the right way to it. The march of John Calvin led him into the history books and led a new faith into its place of world prominence.